Over here, uh, when, the, when there's ice right across, uh, the snowmobiles will be used to, uh, to transport the contraband uh, material. I kind of fab fabricated that cigarette holder. Uh, we can't smoke in bars anymore in California. Good. It got to the point where my boss thought he would have to close. And consequently, that would mean we'd all be out of jobs. This is not really a public health issue. It's a property rights issue. The tobacco companies finding themselves uh, effectively um, hammered into a settlement. Uh, they are not stupid. Neither are the trial lawyers. Neither are the state attorneys general. They wanted to find a way in which the states could get a ton of money. The trial lawyers could get a slightly smaller ton of money. And the tobacco companies wouldn't have to pay very much. Now, that sounded like an impossible task, but they managed to work it out. Effectively, the tobacco companies negotiated with the trial lawyers and the state attorneys general, a sweetheart deal. A deal which effectively passed the cost of the whole settlement on to smokers. I got involved because there are serious constitutional questions about this model and the methodology used by the attorneys general and the private attorneys who were uh, their partners in putting in place this national policy without having any legislation to support it. There are some things done in the master settlement agreement, certainly that the tobacco companies could not have gotten among themselves and agreed to without it being an antitrust violation. Financially, the biggest winners are the big tobacco companies, which have been able to raise their prices almost double what they have to build into their prices to pay for the settlement damages. Twice the amount they've been able to jack their prices up because of this antitrust uh, uh, arrangement. How is it that prices of cigarettes are escalating by 80%? that there are curbs on tobacco advertising, that there are no barriers to entry, physical barriers, financial barriers to get into the tobacco business, and still the four major companies are maintaining a lock on the market, some 96, 97 percent of the market. The answer is, of course, that what this settlement has done is cartelized the tobacco industry. I don't think the master settlement agreement produced any winners or losers. I think the real winners uh, are not going to show up on any chart or anything now, but they're going to be those young people out there, 12, 13, 14 years old, that don't start smoking, don't get addicted, and 40 years from now are less likely to have cancer. Very clearly, the biggest winners in the tobacco settlement were the tobacco companies. Why? They got away with a settlement where they paid only three cents on the dollar. And by the way, they didn't pay a penny of that. They passed all the cost along to the consumers, the smokers, who are, in a way, the victims. They were tricked into smoking uh, when they were teenagers and didn't know any better. Now they're trapped by nicotine addiction. They can't escape. You know, so let's make them pay more for cigarettes so that we can give rich trial lawyers another you know, vacation home or yacht or whatever. I mean, that seems fair, doesn't it? I mean, so that's the essence of it. But I mean, the amazing thing is that, yeah, most people do think it's fair. Because, you know, most people don't smoke, so screw the smokers. They don't care. So we put our cigarettes out here and we go in and we drink and talk and whatnot and come back out and take a couple hits and go back in just to save the cigarettes because they're like five bucks a pack. Price increases on cigarettes, a little more than half of those price increases are paid for by smokers that have an income of less than $30,000. Mother's Day in 1992, I went cold turkey. And the story around that is fairly, was fairly moving for me. My family went out. And I asked my husband as he left home to fill my Nicorette prescription and bring Nicorette back. It was not over the counter then. And they came back with flowers and gifts and cards. And I turned to my husband and said, did you remember to get my Nicorette? And he hadn't. And I felt rage, rage. And I, it was the first time that I actually saw myself as an addict. And I never had another cigarette. The notion that tobacco use is a question of choice is bogus. They're selling a product that contains a drug that is as addictive, if not more addictive, than heroin and cocaine. Addiction specialists who run clinics treating heroin and cocaine addicts say that long after they've gotten their patients off of heroin and cocaine, they're still smoking. 
and they can't get them to stop. I have, I have smoked, and I continue to smoke on occasion. And I realize that it's bad for me. When I started experimenting with tobacco, I used to smoke uh, because uh, it, I found it to be a very uh, pleasurable activity. I did smoke when I, was, when I was young. I think as many young people do, I, I experimented uh, with cigarettes. And I guess after a while, decided I didn't, didn't really need them, didn't really like them, and stopped smoking. The fact is the smokers saw a warning label on the side of the pack and went ahead and smoked anyway. So we did not purport to represent smokers. We represented the state, we represented taxpayers, and we represented children. But this is not about health. This is all about big bucks flowing into the coffers, first of the states, and second, the trial lawyers. Uh, well, there are about as many ideas or pet projects for the tobacco settlement money as there are dollars going into these funds. Um, we've seen proposals to spend the money on college scholarships in Michigan, on a new morgue uh, in North Dakota, on sidewalk repairs in Los Angeles on a dinosaur museum in one of the states. I was one of the lead negotiators uh, for the states. Pennsylvania receives, uh, you know, I think the fourth highest amount of money. Uh, but it's, that's not what it's about. It's about how you spend your money. The strange sort of a way the states are in the tobacco business now. Because if the, uh, if the sales of tobacco, if the sales of cigarettes go down, then, then the state's share of the money that they get from the settlement is also going to go down. In terms of a conflict of interest, I mean, I would challenge, uh, you know, legislators to say that I want more people to smoke so we have more money. Um, we would obviously advocate um, for policies and these programs that would reduce smoking. Well, I mean, I think this is an old story. I mean, uh, since, since there have, uh, tobacco has been in use in the Western world and people have started taxing it, there's always been this problem. Uh, James I hated smoking and condemned it, but he was happy to take the revenue that came from the tobacco trade. Um, and that's true of a lot of politicians nowadays in this country. I think the tobacco money's coming in have just been like big cookie jars uh, for legislative bodies and governors all over the country. Certainly the case in Vermont. Contingency fee lawyers who have agreed to take a skimpy 10 to 30 percent of the settlement proceeds have now settled their claims for the most part and they are scheduled to get over a period of 25 years, something on the order of 10 to 20 billion dollars, much of which gets recycled into the political campaigns of their sponsors. Peter Angelos is a prominent uh, trial attorney in the state of Maryland, um, multi-millionaire, and also the owner of the Baltimore Orioles baseball team. As part of the global settlement, Maryland got an award of 4.4 billion dollars from the tobacco companies. Angelos, as part of his representation of the state in that settlement, wants a fee of $1.1 billion. Hey, man, I think she's checking you out. When we started the very first truth ad, the original body bag ad, we didn't realize that, that the image of the body bag was really going to connect with our target audience. Initially, the truth ads, I'd watch them and laugh and light up a cigarette, but that's just because of the phase I was in my life. They're doing a better job of advertising tobacco than the tobacco companies ever could do. Why doesn't Congress go after downhill skiing? Which is ridiculously dangerous. I mean, there are all kinds of other ways you can get your exercise and enjoy yourself without hurtling down a mountain at, at these huge speeds. Um, you know, so after there's a spate of skiing deaths, like Sonny Bono slammed into a tree and then one of the Kennedys slammed into a tree, and wasn't there somebody else in this, around the same period? You know, why is it you don't, you don't have congressional hearings on the skiing menace and how this needs to be taken care of? And if not banning it outright, which might create a black market, we can at least tax it so that some of the costs, you know, to society are recouped and people are discouraged from engaging in this obviously irrational behavior, which I would never do. I've heard that, that it's, you know, the camel's nose under the tent and okay, you, you know, you did this to tobacco, well, cars are next, and then firearms, and then the beef industry, and the dairy industry, and all this stuff. And what I said to the Vermont legislature when they passed a, a statute that we asked them to pass to facilitate the lawsuit was, no, tobacco is different. The big new, I think, frontier for public health is the whole area of, of eating and exercise, you know, the war on obesity. 
which is, you know, it's a harder nut to crack because, just politically, because everybody eats. You know, only a quarter of adults in America or so smoke, but everybody eats. And according to some, you know, like some of the stricter <laughs> um, uh, scientists, uh, three quarters of us are overweight. Do I want the right to regulate what you choose to do, uh, how you, you know, what you, whether you choose to, to eat certain kinds of things, because eventually that might cost me money? Do I want to regulate the manner in which uh, you live? You do, you know, with, maybe I don't want you to have all those steps in your house, because if I look at the, the numbers on people who fall down steps, you know, I, I'll see that things aren't going to be so expensive if, you know, if I make everybody live on, on one level. A typical anti-smoking activist is not a totalitarian. He's not thinking systematically. He's not saying, well, you know, I don't think you should be allowed to do anything that's risky. Uh, in fact, he would laugh at that notion and say, you know, I, I, nothing I've done implies that. But in fact, the principles under which they seem to be operating suggest that very thing, that there's an open-ended license for government to interfere in our lives, to stop us from doing things that might get us sick, that might get us injured, that might kill us. How far are they going to go before we don't have any rights at all? Take your chances, 